major factor in strategic air command's around-the-clock readiness to respond to any deterrent or retaliatory emergency is its capability to launch its air fleet in minimum time. The minimum interval takeoff, MITO procedure, is designed to permit a SAC unit's alert force to become airborne and on their way to assign targets within 15 seconds of each other. Such effective strategic deterrence depends not only on the immediate readiness of SAC forces, but on the Commander-in-Chief's knowledge at all times of the availability of these forces for employment. The SAC Automated Command and Control System, SACS, provides instant information on the operational status of Strategic Air Command's aircraft and missiles. To explain, let's cite a hypothetical example at the 22nd Bombardment Wing, March Air Force Base. Suppose during the pre-flight of one of the B-52s just seen taking off, a hydraulic leak was discovered in a wheel strut. The malfunction is reported immediately to job control. Within a few moments, a work order is issued for a specialist to be dispatched to repair the leak. Simultaneously, job control advises the wing command post of the disabled aircraft as the CP keeps tab of all critical wing activities. Once the wing commander has been advised of the change in status of his alert force, the controller sends an official report via the SACS data transmission subsystem to the SACS data processing computer. Here, the message is automatically error checked, acknowledged, and the computer database updated. The computer then notifies the display controllers at headquarters SAC and each numbered Air Force that a change in status has occurred. He then uses the data display subsystem to show the up-to-the-minute worldwide status of the SAC alert force to the battle staff. This real-time information, available immediately to all headquarters SAC and numbered Air Force battle staffs, permits the Strategic Air Command to know at all times its ability to provide a measured response to any world threat. The 351st Strategic Missile Wing, Whiteman Air Force Base, Missouri, was one of the sites selected to conduct the giant plow reliability tests. Objectives were to determine the capability of Minuteman launcher closures to function after being closed for extended periods in all kinds of weather. At the test site, preparations included building a barrier of sand and dirt to prevent the door from running off its tracks when open. A velocity meter was installed to record the data needed to determine the speed and distance traveled by the door. Giant plow test director was Lieutenant Colonel Charles S. Coey. Prior to blast off, Colonel Coey made sure that men and equipment were ready. EOD personnel were on hand to see that safety procedures were followed both before and after the test. Everything set, Colonel Coey uses a bullhorn to relay the countdown to men outside the pad area. Inside the area, Master Sergeant Sherwood, the test director's assistant, called the countdown. On signal, the door was opened and impacted against the heavy barrier. Several angles of the action, plus one in slow motion, show more clearly how the door reacted during the test.
recorded results show that the operation was successful. Following a final safety check, a temporary cover was used to seal off the silo until the door could again be closed. Within a few hours after the test, the efficient SAC crew had the site once more completely operational and on alert status. With Minuteman sites on alert status, the missiles can be launched any time of the day or night. A twilight phenomenon launch occurs just before sunrise or just before sunset. In this test, the first stage separated from the three-stage solid rocket and tumbled through the atmosphere as the second stage pushed the payload higher into space. The twilight phenomenon developed as the missile entered the upper atmosphere at approximately 200,000 feet. The gas particles and the ice crystals, which formed in the super cold environment, reflected the high altitude sunlight. Responsibility for this operation was shared jointly by SAC and the Logistics Command. The objective of this twilight phenomenon launch, known as Project Glass Pole, was to test the performance of missile components previously exposed to extremely low and extremely high temperatures. On 21 January 1968, a SAC B-52 carrying hydrogen munitions crashed in Danish territory near Thule Air Base, Greenland. The Stratofortress crashed after an uncontrollable fire filled the cockpit with heavy smoke. The weapons were not armed and incapable of nuclear yield. A SAC disaster control team from Offutt Air Force Base, under the command of Major General Richard O. Hunziker, began around-the-clock recovery operations of the contaminated materials. The number of people involved with the Crested Ice Project grew from the original 68 to some 562 at the peak of operations. Specialists from 72 different locations were airlifted to the disaster area to support ground operations. A base camp constructed near the accident site made sustained activity possible in the hostile Arctic environment in which recovery operations proceeded. Heavy equipment plowed, piled up, and loaded the contaminated crust and debris into large steel containers for storage, shipment, and final disposition. Most of the personnel concerned with Project Crested Ice were working in an Arctic environment for the first time. The rapidity and efficiency with which all required tasks were accomplished demonstrated the high degree of professionalism of the SAC disaster control team. Bunker Hill Air Force Base, Indiana, on 12 May 1968, became Grissom Air Force Base. The home of the 305th Bomb Wing was renamed to honor one of Indiana's native sons, the first Air Force astronaut, Lieutenant Colonel Virgil I. Grissom. During the day of the dedication, many visitors attended the ceremony, including Colonel Grissom's widow and two sons, and his parents and brothers. Guest speaker for the occasion was Assistant Secretary of the Air Force, Mr. Thomas Nielsen, who stated, we are changing the name of Bunker Hill not to pay less tribute to a famous revolutionary battleground, but to pay tribute to a 20th century pioneer in space exploration. Mr. Nielsen went on to summarize some highlights of the Colonel's career. One of the seven original astronauts, on 21 July 1961, he became the second American to enter space. 23 March 1965 signified a milestone in space exploration. On this date, Colonel Grissom, along with Navy Commander John Young, 
flew our country's first three-orbit mission in the Gemini 3, and Gus Grissom became the first man to make two trips into space. He was to have the honor of commanding the first Apollo flight to the moon when tragedy struck. Grissom, with two other astronauts, died in the flash fire which destroyed the Apollo spacecraft at Cape Kennedy during a simulated mission. The Strategic Air Command takes pride in having one of its chief installations named for the first Air Force astronaut to give his life while helping our country maintain leadership in aerospace technology. Lieutenant Colonel Virgil I. Grissom. The McKay Trophy, established in 1911 by the late Clarence H. McKay, honors the most meritorious flight during the preceding calendar year. Presented at the Pentagon by the Air Force Chief of Staff, the award for 1967 goes to a SAC KC-135 crew. Major John W. Castile, aircraft commander, Captain Richard L. Trail, pilot, Captain Dean L. Hoare, navigator, and the refueling technician, Master Sergeant Nathan C. Campbell. This SAC air crew distinguished themselves when suddenly called upon to air refuel a Navy A-3 tanker. This tanker, in turn, was enabled to refuel Navy F-8 aircraft. In addition to this historic refueling feat, the professional competence of the SAC KC-135 personnel resulted in saving six Navy aircraft with their crews. General John P. McConnell, Chief of Staff, personally congratulated the men on their achievement. Mr. Secretary, General Lee Wade, uh, is anyone here uh, representing the Department of the Navy? For saving six airplanes, I should think that they could have sent somebody <laughs> over to represent them. But I do want to take this opportunity to express my congratulations to this crew. Uh, once again, it has been demonstrated that uh, you can uh, continue aircraft in flight if they're properly equipped for refueling. And sometimes you have to take extraordinary measures to keep some of them in flight. You have to put an extra refueler between the main refueler and the aircraft that need the, need the fuel. I think this was a great thing that, that uh, this crew did. And um, it's a well-deserved honor. And I'm delighted to have the opportunity to present these certificates and also, at this time, to present the crew with the McKay Trophy, which, of course, is too big for you to carry around, so we keep it here and put your names on it. Thank you very much, and thank all of you for attending. Taking off from bases in Thailand, on Guam, and Okinawa, SAC's B-52s head for targets in Vietnam to dump their huge bomb loads. During these strikes, they concentrate on areas indicating the most intense enemy pressure, sorties known as arc light. When bomb release point is reached, each stratofortress drops some 30 tons of explosives on targets more than 30,000 feet below. The targets show countless scars. The terrain following a B-52 assault has been described as looking as if it had been swept by a giant rake. In lending this vital and effective support to Southeast Asia operations, 
SAC uses its men and equipment to the fullest extent. When a B-52 returns from a bombing mission, taxis in and parks, immediately ground support personnel get it ready for another sortie. The crew deplanes and immediately proceeds to maintenance debriefing. Here, a complete maintenance debriefing provides ground crews with the information needed to resolve any problems before the bomber takes off again on a turnaround mission. No time is lost in performing routine maintenance, servicing with oil, refueling the aircraft. Before the aircraft takes off again, any malfunctions pointed out during the maintenance debriefing are taken care of. The munitions crew transports the required armament to the Stratal Fortress. While the B-52s are being readied, the air crews are being briefed on their upcoming missions. At a bomber, the pilots conduct the walk-around inspection. Everything ready, the B-52s taxi out and are soon on their way. Bombing accuracy and flexibility has been greatly improved in Southeast Asia since deployment of SAC's radar ground-directed bombing system. This system is known as Combat Sky Spot and is integrated into the tactical air control system. It is used by both the fighter bomber and SAC B-52s. The use of Combat Sky Spot has reduced the number of pre-planned B-52 strikes. Frequently, the bombers are launched to a predetermined point and then they receive directions to the highest priority target from the sky spot controller. This procedure has greatly reduced SAC's reaction time in placing bombs on target. When hack is announced over the radio, the bombs are released. Three, two, one, hack! Skyspot, therefore, is capable of providing immediate reaction by directing bombers day or night to known or suspected areas of enemy concentration. In summary, a combination of combat Skyspot and B-52s subjects enemy forces, supply areas, and lines of communication to constant threat, harassment, and destruction. On 29 July, 1968, General Bruce K. Holloway became Commander-in-Chief of the Strategic Air Command. General Holloway replaced General Joseph J. Nazaro, whose new assignment is Commander-in-Chief Pacific Air Forces, Hickam Air Force Base, Hawaii. Some 3,000 people looked on as the SAC Band, Honor Guard, and various Air Force officers participated in the colorful ceremony. General Holloway's personal flag was uncased, symbolizing the change of command. The General's long and distinguished record of Air Force service includes many awards and decorations. Entering the United States Military Academy at West Point in 1933, he graduated in 1937. Proceeding to flying schools, at Randolph and Kelly Airfields, Texas, he was awarded pilot wings in 1938. From 1939 to 1941, the general served his first major tour in Hawaii. Following various assignments and promotions to captain, major, and lieutenant colonel, he became a full colonel in 1943 while serving with the Flying Tigers and later became this outfit's commander. In 1946, he commanded the Army Air Corps' first jet-equipped fighter group, 
performing pioneer service in the new field of tactical jet air operations. Graduating from the National War College in 1951, his promotions and responsibilities rapidly increased until in 1961, General LeMay, past commander of SAC, pinned on General Holloway's third star, and he became STRICOM's deputy commander at MacDill Air Force Base, Florida. After receiving his fourth star while commanding the United States Air Forces Europe, he began his assignment as Air Force Vice Chief of Staff, serving in this capacity until becoming the SAC Commander-in-Chief. While Vice Chief of Staff, General Holloway achieved the distinction of having flown every jet in the Air Force inventory by piloting the new SR-71 on a routine test mission. When the general deplaned, due recognition was accorded him for completing a most successful flight in SAC's newest reconnaissance weapon system. Concerning his appointment, General Holloway has this to say. As the new commander-in-chief of SAC, I welcome this opportunity to speak to many of you for the first time and to express my views on subjects which I consider of the greatest importance to all of us. I would like to emphasize that SAC will continue its role as this nation's primary deterrent to nuclear war, that it will continue to support the Allied forces operating against the communist thrust in Southeast Asia, and that it will remain responsive to meet the needs of national policy in the future. SAC's proud tradition in the Air Force has been built on the dedication and the professional acceptance of responsibility by every airman, non-commissioned officer, and officer of the command during its 23-year history. This heritage is now in our hands yours and mine. And with your continued support, SAC will meet any demands placed on it today and build for the future. This is a hallmark of the command that I have noted, the ability to meet the challenges of today and yet prepare for those of tomorrow. In the future, we must meet our challenges with fewer and less experienced personnel as well as a smaller portion of the Department of Defense budget. We will be using newer and more sophisticated equipment and be asked to continue demanding alert and training schedules. I know that I can count on each of you to carry out your part of this assignment. I'm especially proud to be a member of SAC and I want to meet and talk personally with as many of you as I possibly can during the coming months.